So I'm joined by Amanda. Amanda has had the job over the last couple of days to take the questions that you ask me on a Saturday on my Instagram Q&A and pull a couple of them, make contact with you guys and then ask you to give them to us in an audio format. That's where we've got the questions from. Amanda's going to keep me in check. Make sure I'm actually answering the question that you asked because these questions, it's the first time I'm getting to hear them. So I'm just going at it. Okay. So let's just jump in, Amanda. Amanda, for people, just for a bit of background, works with me in Prosperous and she is fully responsible for all the marketing that um, Prosperous does and some of the stuff that you see on my page as well and all across the Prosperous um, group. Hi. So our question is we're, we're currently living way beyond our means, spending all our savings um, and pretty much spending them on groceries. We have uh, one income and two kids under four. How should we manage our finances better or turn it around, basically? So I think the first thing to say, one income, two kids under four, maybe it's a choice one of them doesn't want to work. Um, Maybe it's financial. Maybe it doesn't make sense for one of them to work because of the cost of childcare. Um, What that person is describing to me there, though, is is what lots of people in the country are going through. It's inflation. And it's, we have this salary. Maybe that choice was made at a time. If it is a choice that one of them works and one of them stays at home and looks after the kids, if, it's a, if that was a choice at the time, it made financial sense at the time. But now with the squeeze of interest rates and inflation, they're finding it's harder to get to the end of it. The big red flag for me there is, is that they are dipping into the savings. Yeah. Okay, go on. The one good thing I would say is that they have their savings there to dip into as well in order to, they're not dipping into or not putting something on a credit card or... Yeah. But they are dipping into the savings, so they need to get to a point where they're getting back on track and the savings are yeah. going up rather than down. And one of the things we have to be very careful of here is the savings will be finite. When the yeah. savings run out, they are dipping on yeah. credit cards. They are doing they have a bit of runway at the moment, right? And if if they didn't, it just sounds to me from that question that they are actually regularly dipping into savings. It's not that one month has hit them. It's that they're regularly dipping into their savings. And this has got the difference between cash flow and capital expenditure. And what I mean by that is, is your income should be able to cover your month. Mm. And when it's not, you have to dip into your savings. Your savings should be for capital events, like we're doing up the house, we're going on a an unexpected trip or something that is not allowable to cover in your day-to-day expenses. And what this person really needs to address is they've got two two things that they control. Um, or not even two things. They've got two inputs here. One is income and one is expenditure. The income is probably out of their control, but they can they could control it by one of them going back to work. I'm not putting that on them and I'm not suggesting mm-hmm. that that's what that family needs to do. But income is less so in their control, but then you're back to expenditure. And if they're right at the pin of their collar in terms of their expenditure, if they've already stripped everything back out, That's a really hard thing to do in terms of um, where do you look next? But what I would suggest, and we're going to talk about this at the end, I really think that person's going to get a great bit out of our conscious versus subconscious spending that I'm going to wrap the whole show up with today. And I think that person needs to hang on. I don't want to say, here's what you could have won and here's what you're going to get later. But I do think that really the expenditure is where the focus needs to go on. And that's where I think they're going to get the the win. Do you think I'm a bit harsh on them there, Amanda? I I think... I think we could go into, if, if you could go into a bit more detail, I suppose, on what they could do with their expenditures. Thinking back to when we did the spring bean challenge. challenge. And it's something that they could, there's, there's lots of different things that they could look into. Yeah. Um, from, I, su- I suppose it's a, it's a short voice clip. We don't know a whole lot about this person, but we can't we can't just think that they have gone to all their providers say for example for bills I actually think I I admire you there getting the spring clean challenge in there which was one of your most successful campaigns of the year Amanda (laughs) well done for people who don't know the spring clean challenge was something we did earlier on in the year in um, in spring on Instagram and it basically took week day by day wasn't it a week but it was a couple of steps that we said this is how you're going to clean out your finances week by week different tasks um, but it is something that you could look back on and it, it, it really took you from looking at what you're exp- spending day to day, making you, as you said, you're going to go into the conscious versus uh, subconscious spending 
all that. But I suppose this laid out different steps for yeah. you to... The, the step-by-step guide as to what to do now, yeah, what to do yeah, next, what yeah. to do next. And what I loved about that actually, and I think why it worked so well, was because it was bite size. We yeah. weren't asking anyone to de- devote a Saturday to doing no, this. This no. was a quick get in, get out, get a win, move on. Yeah, and, and it was weekly as well. So it was, yeah. you do, yeah. you, you look after a certain amount. If you give yourself the mountain of trying to look into everything at once, yeah. it can be very overwhelming. But if you break it down into smaller tasks, it yeah. can be a lot easier. What I will say about that person is a whole pile of stuff we don't know. But what we yeah. do know is that this is not sustainable. Dipping yes. into your savings yeah, on a yeah. regular basis is a bad sign and they need to go and fix it. Yeah. Let's go with the next question. Hi, Owen. Where do I start to plan my finances so that I'm covered for all my normal day-to-day expenses, but I also have something there for the unexpected so that I can try and stay away from some sort of short-term loan for when something unexpected does come up? This, to me, is one answer. And that's buffer. Yeah. Okay, so let's just explain what the buffer concept is. This person's kind of going, okay, so I'm getting along. I'm kind of getting through my month to month, but sometimes I get hit with financial surprises. Financial surprises, I would say, I'm not going to say completely non-existent, but they are actually more or less non-existent. It's not a financial surprise. It was that you weren't prepared for this financial event. Like people would say, oh, I was financially surprised I spent so much on Christmas. Christmas has happened every year of your life, right? It's not a surprise, right? Or back to school cost me this. And I'm not saying, I'm not casting aspersions on people who can't afford back to school. I'm saying, telling me it's a surprise. It's not a surprise that you went on holidays this year in July when you've gone on holidays every July for the last 10 years. That's not a surprise. So it's about being prepared. And that's what a buffer does. So the concept of a buffer is that you have a pot of money. The gold standard would be if you've got a steady income, the household income multiplied by three. So if you're on the house earns, let's keep it simple, a thousand euros a month, you multiply that by three, that's three thousand euros a month, three thousand euros in total, sorry, is sitting in your buffer, okay? If the household has a very erratic income, say it's only got one income in the household, they're self-employed, they get paid some months, they don't other months, sometimes the job doesn't pay till the following week or whatever the case is, then I would suggest it's six times. And people used to say to me, six times salary sitting, six months salary sitting there, just not being used just in case we have an emergency. Then COVID happened and everyone goes, oh, six months salary, I get you, right? So six months salary. And then depending on your circumstance, you're going to be between three and six. Sometimes people go, I could never save three months salary and just put it to one side. And then they get put off by the whole idea. For that person, just pick a random number that's achievable, like a thousand or fifteen hundred euros. Just get yourself a buffer. The key and the learnings from a buffer come from the idea that let's say you've got your buffer, uh, the washing machine breaks down, Mm -hmm. right? Or you get it in and you get an invoice to a wedding. Invoice to a wedding, I meant, didn't I? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you did that went over your head, didn't yeah. it? <laughs> it did. So you get an invoice to a wedding. Did you get it that time? Yeah. Great. Okay. So you get an invoice to a wedding and you go, oh, I wasn't expected to be invited to that. You dip into your buffer. Mm. Okay. What you need to, and actually we'll jump away from the wedding one because that was a random one, right? But the the home insurance bill comes in. Okay, it's 480 quid. You haven't prepared for it financially. You take the 480 quid out of your buffer. Financial priority number one after that is to get the buffer back up to where Mm -hmm. it needs to be. Okay, but the second thing you need to do is, is you need to set up, use like a vault or a space or a wallet or even a physical envelope if you want to go there and put 40 quid a month into it. And in 12 months time, when the home insurance bill comes in again for 480 quid, you're not dipping into your buffer this time. You're going for the envelope, whether that's a, an online one or a physical one. And you've got yourself prepared for it. That person seems like they're actually doing okay. They're just kind yeah. of getting knocked off track from time to time. And until the buffer's in place, they're going to continue to get knocked off track. Yeah, but fair play to that person as well for recognising that they need, they they do need to get their, their buffer in place. And I know you have mentioned, because you, you did say base it on income, mm. but you can start because that can be it it can daunting. be quite daunting for people mm. to think, oh, having three to six months of my income put aside, yeah. I'm using that money all the time. Or, And I think it, you've also referenced it before, trying to get the expenses yeah. is probably the your expenditure 
That's in the, place that's first. the core, yeah. And so, then... So I think if you've no buffer today, the first step is to get yourself to, let's say, 1,500 euros, right? The next step then is, is to say, what's three times my expenses for a month? And then the next step after that is getting three times my salary for a month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and get that into a thing. So I think that's the, I think that's probably a very conclusive answer for that person because it doesn't sound like they're really struggling. They're just getting caught off guard from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's just really sharing how people can get their buffer in place. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose you could see from the the first question we got in, people are struggling. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's quite nice to actually... And that comes down to your control, your controllables. Yeah. That's all you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, right, let's go for the third question. I think this is a final question, is it, Amanda? Yes. Hi, Owen. Do you foresee interest rates reducing in the near future? So we had a conversation. So this is interest rates. Do we think, do, do we come, see them coming down? Um, it's interesting. I have had a longer term opinion or a long term, not a longer term, my opinion on long term interest rates and I haven't really been very public about this, but now I have the confidence to be public because Jim Power is an economist and he agrees with me. But I kind of felt that where we are now or maybe a little bit less than this is probably our long-term average. Um, and I'd be happy to be a bit more public about that now in the future. And just remind us all, he said uh, he said 25 to 3% for ECB and I asked him, does that really mean 4% for mortgages? And he said, yeah, more or less, right? So... I don't, what I would suspect is anyone who tells you exactly what's going to happen, and I'm not casting aspersions on Jim here, but anyone tells you exactly what's going to happen in interest rates between now and Christmas is absolutely guessing. And he would admit that too, right? They're absolutely guessing. So you don't know what's going to happen in the short term. But what we can look at is, is in the long term, in and around 4% for mortgages is probably right in an ordinary functioning banking environment. It's not going to go back to where it was, down to zero. And people need to get that out of their head. It's not going to go back to 2% mortgages unless we have a major financial crisis of some sort that the central banks are forced to push it down to 0%. Remember the last time we went down to 0%, it took us 15 years to get back up off it and 0% isn't the place to be for the ECB rate. So are you saying that 4%, not 4% of an increase from this point, that it should hover around the 4%? Yes. Yeah. So when you're forward. looking at mortgage interest rates, they should be in and around 4%. 4%. That means some fixed might be cheaper than that and some fixed might be more expensive. The variable might be up and down from that, but the average should be in and around 4%. Um, and But remember, that's an ordinary functioning banking environment. We far from have that here in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. And with, I suppose, with you just admitting that now, so do you see, do you have any other opinions on how it will look in the next year or so for uh, Ireland? Yeah. So what I would say is, is I don't know exactly what's going to happen. My, my guess, and it is a big guess, is I do think, and Jim and I spoke about this earlier, I do think that we're going to, level off for a while with the rate rises. Um, And what you will find is that levelling off, then they will start to come down when they start to see inflation hitting 2% or heading towards 2%. They'll slowly come down. But I think they're going to come down very, very slowly. And I do believe the ECB will come, which would affect us here, is going to come down slower. Whatever about the UK, it's going to come slower down than the US will. Um, Because again, in the discussion with Jim, we have a single mandate in Europe. We have to use interest rates to get inflation to 2% and keep it there. Okay. In the US, they can use interest rates. They have a dual mandate. They can use interest rates to get inflation to 2% or whatever their target rate is, but they can also use interest rates to control or spur on the economy. So they have a dual mandate and they can do either or. So I think they will be more aggressive and they will just do things faster than us because they're allowed to, I suppose. Whereas mm-hmm. ours has to be based on where does the data suggest we're going to get to 2% in inflation and they'll use interest rates to control that. But interestingly, if you do ex- accept that 25 to 3% is the long-term ECB rate, add your tracker to that and see where you're going to end up. And if you accept what Jim said earlier on, that, yeah, the standard rate's going to be in around 4%, variable rates could be very different from that. Remember, yeah. right now we have an unusual, we're getting an unusual vision of what interest rates look in Ireland. We, the banks here, have always, for, sorry, for the last 10 or 15 years, have been up there at the most expensive interest rates in Europe. Right now we're third cheapest, yeah. Right. So don't let that codge you into thinking, oh, we're going to stay like this. This is the new normal. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. the new normal. So we have to look at what our long term history looks like to decide where long term interest rates are going to be. What I would say to people, though, is, is that because we've kind of gone there with interest rates, 
it's what I've said time and time again. If you're deciding on a tracker, if you're deciding on a new mortgage, if you're tr- deciding on whether you should go fixed or variable, the most important thing is sleep. You yeah. need to be able to sleep at night without your mortgage repayment coming into your head. So whatever is right for you and specific for you, get some advice and do that. Yeah, and don't listen to everybody. I know I we um, agreed our mortgage rate two, two years ago now. And at the time, everyone was like, you're mad to go for a mortgage now. The house prices are so expensive. Everything is so crazy at the moment. Yeah. We were told we were crazy mm. to buy a house at that that point yeah. and our house has only gone up in value so far I know yeah. things will take dips yeah. and everything but it's it's only got harder from from that point and we were told at that point two years ago so you are mad yeah. and what I would say there is is anyone we, we that's again here's the marketeer in you we're going to do a full episode on property and property <laughs> prices yeah. so we're going to park that one just for yeah, now yeah, yeah. but I do think and Amanda if you're back in with us that day let's talk if you don't mind we'll talk a little bit about your Absolutely. experience and yeah, why yeah. What, what that felt like when everyone was telling you you were mad yeah, yeah. Um, but Interest rates, short term, not sure where they're going, um, but I suspect that they'll probably go up a little bit more at some stage in the next six months. They'll go up, it might be immediately, it might be a little bit further on, um, but I think they're going to plateau for probably 12 or 15 months before we start to see them come down again. Yeah. Um, but having said that, that's what's going to happen with the ECB. We are the third cheapest in Europe at the moment and what our banks do might be very, very different because they have a lot of meat that they could eat into to put them back at the top of the charts is the most expensive in Europe again. So that's really the questions for today. What I would say is thanks, Amanda, for coming in. Um, we're going to make you a regular for the for, for, the, for, for now. You did well. You we'll passed see. the test. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I don't mean that. There was never a test. That's what I mean by yeah, right. But no, thanks for coming in. And um, just to remind people, we will be collecting these questions. So if you don't get your question answered on a Saturday on Instagram, Amanda might be reaching out to you, asking you to give us a voice note and we'll use it here instead.